the Royal University of Warsaw comprised five departments, Law and Administrative Sciences, Medical Sciences, Theology, Philosophy, Fine Arts and Humanities. Its founders, outstanding representatives of the Enlightenment elites, had an ambition to teach students not only theoretical but also practical knowledge. This Warsaw formula seems to be a combination of the two models the German research model and the French, more pragmatic one, more dependent on the state. This was possible owing to the creation of the science cabinets at the university, although the way in which they were established may be surprising. In the creation of these university collections, these scientific cabinets, there is an evident pattern that repeats itself. They were not built on the gradual collection of specimens, but the most important ones were purchased as large collections. This was the case of the zoological cabinet and the mineralogical cabinet, but also of the plaster casts collection. They were large collections purchased in one go in Poland and abroad. This was also the case of the numismatic collection. There is a noticeable haste. It is not possible to do it slowly. The concept was to have these cabinets and collections so well equipped that they could be used for didactic purposes straight away. It seems that in this case, haste did not mean arbitrary collection. The collections acquired in this way quickly became a kind of tourist attraction. It was typical of the age that anyone visiting Warsaw would also view the university collections. These more important collections were not exclusively educational establishments, they were public museums. For example, the zoological collection. We know that it was frequently visited, it enjoyed great popularity. And similarly, the anatomy collection at the Department of Medicine was immensely popular. There are reports that it was necessary to push through the crowds that had gathered to see the embalmed cadavers, infants with two heads, all that was usual in these collections. The university collections gained the admiration of such eminent visitors as Alexander von Humboldt, brother of the founder of the university in Berlin. Mr. Humboldt visited Warsaw's cabinets, reported the daily Kurier Warszawski in 1830. He arrived there in the company of the most eminent president of the Society of Friends of Sciences. He began his tour in the zoological cabinet, where he spent an hour and a half. He engaged in long, friendly conversations in French and German with the professors of our university. Mr. Bentkowski presented him with a list of university cabinets. The list included a numismatic cabinet, a collection of plaster casts and architectural models. The visit proved a notable success. This learned gentleman continually visits all the scientific establishments in the capital. He declared that he had not expected to see so carefully arranged and rich cabinets. He was particularly pleased with the observatory. The numismatic cabinet met with deserved esteem. A certain hierarchy is striking. A huge amount of money was spent on the numismatic cabinet, which may seem strange to us. An amount was spent on a single exhibit, the greatest exhibit, that was equal to the amount spent on the entire collection of books brought for the library from the founding of the university to the time it was closed. It seems strange, but I think it was done partly for reasons of prestige. That is, the university ought to have a numismatic collection as it ought to also have an astronomical observatory. Also, numismatic collections are very important for historical research. One of the laboratories which attracted the greatest interest was the zoological cabinet, which had more than 25,000 specimens by 1827. The collection included stuffed Polish bison, which were donated to the university most probably by Tsar Nicholas I. These animals, and more precisely the fauna of the Białowieża forest, were the subject of a scientific study prepared by Paweł Felix Jarocki, professor at the university. 
However, the author of this monumental multi-volume work, entitled Zoology, did not enjoy much popularity among his students, who were quite critical of him. The most boring of all were Yarotsky's zoology lectures. He did not see anything else in the animals but claws, teeth, hooves, beaks, and all those things which are important for the classification of orders, families, genera, and species. His head was filled with pigeonholes that he populated with zoological material. He did not care at all about what an animal is, how it behaves, lives, functions, how it finds its dignity among the other organic creatures. Only details, particulars, external characteristics, but no deeper insight. According to the chroniclers of those days, the zoological cabinet was open on Tuesdays and Thursdays, attracting a lot of interested visitors. The cabinet had a set of wax models of different plants, handmade by Professor Hoffman, who would speak to the students about phlogiston without even mentioning the newly discovered oxygen. The mineralogical collection also attracted universal admiration. The mineralogical cabinet, open to the public every Tuesday, distinguished itself by the number and variety of specimens especially the beautiful casts of flora and fauna, fossils and an amazing collection of agates attracted the visitors' attention. Doubles, which numbered up to 15,000, were used to create 12 minor collections which were then sent to provincial schools. Although from our perspective today such a selection of specimens may be surprising, historians of culture have no doubt that it confirms that the authorities of Congress Poland kept up with the Western European trends. It was a period in which all monarchs of Europe set up museums and opened their collections of natural history to the general public. The British Museum was created after the British Parliament purchased the natural history collection of Sir Hans Sloane. It was only much later that it became a museum of art. At the beginning, it was a natural history museum, which was a standard process of creating museums in the countries of Northern Europe. That natural sciences may become the jewel of the university in the next few years is demonstrated by recent investments. At the university, we now attach great importance to the practical aspect of our research. We have managed to form high-level scientific teams. And therefore, I think that the center of new technologies, which was established in 2012, will very quickly become the trademark of the university and an important scientific center in Europe. The university will not be perceived as an ivory tower, home only to eggheads detached from reality, but as a place where we do something very useful for people, very practical and very important.